Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege we have that on a day like this, we're able to be in your presence in our various homes. We thank you because the church in the house, as we see in the Bible, was a vibrant church. A church that came together in various homes to worship the Lord. We thank you because of the privilege we have in our time that we are able to do this. Father, take all the glory, take all the honor in Jesus' name. Lord, we are praying that today, as we search the scriptures in our various homes, in this house, church, family, church, home, church, Lord, you will teach us by your spirit. We know that you are a faithful God, and today you are going to bless each and every one of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we are continuing with our search the scriptures. As we have always done when we come together, we are going to search the scriptures before the Sunday message. Let's not forget that last Sunday we also had a session of searching the scriptures. And in our study last Sunday, we looked at follow-up and discipleship. In that study, we saw that the Lord has given us a mandate. It is a mandate of preaching the gospel. And then after preaching, by the grace of God, the Lord gives us converts. These converts are like little babies born into the world. We are not to leave them to themselves. We do all we can to follow them up, disciple them, bring them to the point of spiritual maturity, that they themselves become useful instruments in the hands of God. And the Lord expects us to do this at daily, at all times, not waiting until the church gives us an instruction, a general announcement to do a crusade, to do a program, but we do it as part of our lives, it becomes a daily routine to win souls to the Lord. And what a time in which we live, a time like this, when we're all at home because of the situation around us, to preach the gospel to our immediate neighbors, preach the gospel to those in our household. We do it in all that the Lord has given unto us. We have tools in our hands. And as we do this and follow up these converts, they will become matured in the faith and they will grow in the grace of God. Today we are looking at another study and it is titled Sowing and Reaping. I repeat, Sowing and Reaping. We can say that together in our various homes. Sowing and Reaping. One to go. Sowing and Reaping. Reaping. Now, our memory verse is taken from Second Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We are going to take it from verse 6. So you open your Bible with me to Second Corinthians chapter 9. And then we shall read verse 6 together after the count of two. One, two, go. For this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Shall we say it again? For this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. That's the memory verse for our study of today. Title is Sowing and Reaping. We have some passages of the scripture that we are going to read together. But because of our circumstance, since we are not together in the church environment, I will be reading from here. And I will read first, first Corinthians chapter 9. Sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians 
chapter 9. I will read from verse 1. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous to, for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal had provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that, as I said, ye may be ready. Lest haply, if they of Macedonia come with me, and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they will go before you unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof he had noticed before that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. Verse 6. For this I say, he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And he which soweth uh, he, he which soweth, uh, I take that verse again, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he proposed in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. As it is written, he had dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness remained forever. Now he that ministered seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Verse 11 now. Being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causeth through us thanksgiving to God. For the administration of this service not only supply the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. Whilst by the experiment of this administration, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. And by their, par by their prayer for you, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you. Verse 15 now. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. We also read from the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament just before the gospel according to St. Matthew. We're looking at chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. I'll be reading from verses 8 all through to verse 12. Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through to verse 12. Will a man rob God? Yet he have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Look at verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and it shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts. In verse 12. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, says the Lord of hosts. I think a good amen will be right for verse 12. A good amen. Amen. Now, if you also turn your Bible with me to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to read there verse 7. Galatians chapter 6, in verse 7. Here it says, 
Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I want to add verses 8 and 9 because they are very important. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Sowing is the same thing as planting for a farmer. Reaping is the same thing as harvesting for a farmer. And I think it is apt for us to use that illustration that many of us will understand very well. You discover that in life, whether of plants or animals or human beings, the only way we propagate is by planting. We sow, we plant, we plant, we sow. And then we reap after we have planted. Take somebody that plants an orange tree. Of course, the orange tree grows, brings fruits. If you take the seed of the orange and then you plant it again, another orange tree comes up. Take a farmer that goes to the farm and plants grains of corn. The corn will grow into the corn. Then we have cob, we harvest that. And then as we eat the corn, we don't eat everything. We take some, we plant again. And in the process, as we plant, as we sow, it grows up again, gets matured, we harvest it, we reap. So life is full and is made of sowing and reaping. If you look at Genesis, the Lord God who created us from the beginning, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, in verse 20, Genesis chapter 1, in verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that has life and fowl that they may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created great whales and every living creature that moveth which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. Now look at verse 22. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. You will be increasing and increasing. God is not going to be creating more uh, whales, fishes, and birds, and animals as we eat. And then he creates another one. No, that's not it. As be, these animals, these birds, they will keep on multiplying because God has given the command right from the beginning. If you look at Genesis chapter 26, you see there uh, a man that did the planting, that sowed, and uh, he had a good harvest. In Genesis 26, I'm reading from verse 12. Genesis 26, from verse 12. Then Isaac sowed, he planted in that land, and received in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possessions of flocks, you see it, and possessions of herds, and great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. God is going to bless us so much as we sow, we are going to harvest so much that will be the envy of people around us in Jesus' name. If that is, your, is for you, you just have to say good, good amen in that home. I want us to say amen. God, the blessing is for you. You are the son of Abraham. You are a descendant from Isaac. Now, we are looking at this study today, and we are considering three things. Number one, sowing the secret of prosperity. If you want to prosper, there's only one way. You have to sow. You have to sow good seed. Not only that, point number two, sincerity, manner, and motive of the sower. We can sow, but if the manner is not right, if our sowing is not sincere, if our motive is not right, we will not be able to get the required reaping, 
and harvest. Our sowing will, be, will not be acceptable unto God. That's why we look at the sincerity, the manner, the motive of the sower. And then finally, we are going to consider certainty of reaping for the righteous sower. If you are sowing and you are living right, does God have a plan for you to reap? Of course, yes. Is this plan certain? Or, you know, it's just, well, God may, God may not. No, 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 no. There is a certainty of reaping for the righteous sower. Point number one, sowing, the secret of prosperity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we are reading from verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, in verse 6. But this I say, he we sow it sparingly, shall reap also sparingly, and he will sow it bountifully, shall reap also bountifully. Verse 7, Every man, according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. In the economy of God, to receive we must give. If you look at that verse 7, it talks about giving. And it is a word that has been used as, you know, uh, uh, in exchange for the word sowing. It's the same thing. Sowing, giving, giving, sowing. If you look at Malachi, we read it. We can still take it again. Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3, in verse, Malachi chapter 3, in verse 10. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes, bring ye, sow, give, the same thing, all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat, meat, what's that? Food, what's that? Provision, what's that? Abundance. In the storehouse, what's that? In the house of God. That there may be meat in my house. God says, bring your tithe, bring your offering to my storehouse. And if you do this, says, and prove me now. Just try me. Just test me. Just prove me, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. This is wonderful promise from our Father. Wonderful promise from our Creator. He says we bring our tithes, we bring our offerings to his house. He says in the process, try him, test him, and you will see what he God will do. In Luke chapter 6, Luke's gospel, chapter 6, I'm going to read there verse 68. Many of us may know this verse of scripture, and this is the very word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 38 of Luke chapter 6, it says, give, so." Give, and it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. That is, whatever you sow is what you reap. If you sow sparingly, you, re you receive sparingly. If you sow abundantly, that's why he says, God I mean, our Lord Jesus Christ tells us that we should sow abundantly, that the same measure, good measure, that we meet with our, that we sow, we shall also receive. Now, what's our tithe? Our tithe is the tenth or ten percent of our gross earnings if we are salaried workers. If you are a business person, it is after you have, uh, you know, sold your goods, you have removed the capital. You look at the profit. And then a tenth of that profit 
is our tithe. What's our offering? Our offering is anything else we give over and above our tithes. What does the Lord require from us? He requires that we give our tithes. He requires that we give our offering. Now, I have a question for you. Now, the way we are going to do it today, I will ask you, ask you the question. And then, at the end of the teaching, I will, go, I will give you the answer. And then you will score yourself. You know, we did that in school. Uh, the teacher will put a question on the board. And everybody will, uh, you know, give an answer. And then we'll say, oh, exchange your note so you can mark it. But now you are going to mark your note by yourself. The qu first question I have is, in what ways can one give to God? In what ways can one give to God? to God. With what I've just said, that you give your tithe, give your offering to God, and then, you know, what other ways? Are there other ways we can give to God? Now let's understand that in our local churches, there are needs to be met. The church is to be maintained. All the full-time workers, we still need to take care of them. We pay their work, pay them their salaries for services that they are rendering to the church uh, sacrificially. And the Lord requires that we partner with him in getting these things done. God is not going to open the heavens and rain our local currency on us. Just let it fall down from heaven. And then we start distributing to settle all the, you know, the, 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 the utility bills, the light bills, the telephone bills, the water bills. No. It requires that we bring our resources together. And it is when we do this that there will be enough in the house of God to use for the service of the work of the kingdom. We ultimately bring these resources together. As you know, God is not collecting any salary from us. And God is not requiring a building. So if we bring our resources together, and we use it for the services that we get from people, we use it for the services that uh, we get from the water corporation, from the, you know, uh, the electricity corporation and all that, it is for our comfort. So, in a sense, we are really helping ourselves. And when we don't give, what we do is that we starve this body of Christ of needed resources. Sometimes we also have need to, you know, build our churches. And you know, it's amazing that uh, we, uh, we do not do well when we live in houses that are well built up. We spend, uh, you know, thousands and sometimes millions of our currency, you know, to put these buildings up. And uh, the place where we worship uh, is nothing to write to me about. And the, the pastors, uh, many of them, in fact, uh, our pastors, God, we bless them. The sacrifice they make to leave everything. And then to give themselves to tally to the service of the Lord, we starve the church or funds or to get things done in the house of God. This is not right. That's why we cannot but give of the blessings that God has given unto us. We cannot but give of it to his work. Our giving we will not be limited to, you know, the financial giving, money and all that. We can also give of our time. So we are looking for workers, people that will get involved in the work of the Lord. And they will give their time to teach children church, children church. If we ask today, how many body, how many, many people want to help us to work in the children's section? We discover that people, they shy away. They say, well, the children, they make too much noise. I cannot take them. I cannot, you know, accommodate their noise, their this, their that. But we all, we pray to be parents. Now, as parents, we have children at home. Why don't we volunteer our service? I say, I want to work with the children. What about the youth section? I want to volunteer my service to work with the children's section. I want to sing in the choir. I want to get involved in, and use my intellect and use my education to serve the Lord in the IT section and the electronic section. I want to help to clean the church. These are things that God requires of us. If we will sow of the talents and the time that God has given unto us, I am telling you, prosperity will come in Jesus' name. I said prosperity will come in Jesus' name. I want to hear a good amen. Now, we are to give of ourselves. Now, our giving, is it because we are so rich that it's when we have had enough, we have met every need, 
then we give the remnant to God. No, we don't do that. We give because we are commanded to give. We give because we love God. And that's why the question comes to you. Why is it necessary to give bountifully to God? That's the second question now. The second question. Why is it necessary to give bountifully to the Lord? I know that you, have, you, you must be writing, taking your notes. So why don't you put out the answer? Why? Why is it necessary to give bountifully to the Lord? You know, we cheat ourselves when we give miserly to God. It does not pay to withhold from God. The Bible tells us, look at it, in Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11. Turn your Bible to Proverbs chapter 11. We are reading together from verse 24. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24. There is that scattered and yet increased. There is that withholdeth more than is meet, but it tended to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. You know, these verses are loaded. He says, the reed that scattered and yet increase it. How does that happen? You go to the farm, and then you have a bucket, a cup full of corn. And then you plant one there, and one there, and one there, and one there, scatter it all over the farm, you know? And then what happens at the time of harvest? You have an increase. But then keep this cup of corn in your house. Just lock it up. Say, I don't want anybody to see this corn, to touch this corn. I want to just keep it till the next time of harvest. Now, when people are harvesting, I'll bring out my cup of corn and then I can eat it. Now, what will happen? You will have just a cup of corn, if you are lucky, that is not eaten up already by, you know, termites, by worms and all that. So, there is a scattered and yet increase it. And there is that withhold it more than its meat, but it tended to poverty. You see, when you withhold, you're actually, you know, undoing yourself. That's why the Bible says in verse 25, the Libra soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. Go back to Luke chapter 6, verse 38. He says, give, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. He says, with what measure you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So, we are to give bountifully. We are not to give sparingly. We are not to give selfishly uh, unto the Lord. And that is why we must at all times look at the way we are giving. How we are giving. Uh, let's look at it again from this perspective. Now, um, take your room where you are holding this worship service today as a farmland. And then in this farmland, it is time for planting. And then you decided that I'm going to just plant uh, a third of the space in this room. So you planted a third. And then your son, your daughter, your wife had the same size of land. And decided to plant everywhere. And said, I'm going to saturate this land with everything. I will plant corn, I will plant yam, I will plant you know, maize, I will plant cassava, everything. And he planted everything. At the time of harvest... Who is going to, you know, reap more? Of course, that son, that wife, that decided to plant the entire plot of land. You will just harvest a third. So then you see that the more you plant, the more you harvest. The more you sow, the more you reap. The more you give to God, the more the Lord will give back unto you. Somebody has said, you shovel to God and he shovels back to you with a bigger shovel. And so today, we are going to learn, we are going to, you know, uh, get doing it, shoveling to God, giving to the Lord. Our tithe, our offering, our talent, our resources, everything that the Lord has blessed us with. The last question on this point one, explain the law of sowing and reaping. Now you understand, what is the law of sowing and reaping? Write the answer down. Explain the law of sowing and reaping. Now, I look at the second point, which is sincerity, manner, and motive of the sower. 
You know, the attitude we put forth in anything we do matters a lot. If you are coming to the house of God, for example, and uh, you know that there will be a time for tithes and offering, and then you check your wardrobe, and you look for the dirtiest note, the one that is torn, the one that the beggars may not even take from you. You see, after all, the church will take the money to the bank. And then you come. And then it's time for offering. Time for tithes. Then you raise it up like every other person. The question is, are you giving because others are giving? Or you are giving because you love God? Sincerity. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we are reading there from verses 7 and 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. Every man, according as he proposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, of necessity. For God loveth a cheerful giver. I ask you, are you cheerful in giving to God? Or you are like somebody under compulsion? You're like somebody under pressure. You're like somebody that is forced to give. And in giving to God, you do it grudgingly. Whether it is your time as a worker, going for a workers' meeting, it's a burden. When serving God and when giving to God becomes a burden, what about God? What do you think God will look? How do you think God will look at you and consider your service? When giving your financial resources, your you know money and uh, your talent to the work of the kingdom of God, and you do it, you know, grudgingly, how do you think God will accept such a, an offering? Every man, according as he proposes in his heart, let him give, not grudgingly, of necessity, because God loves a cheerful giver. You know, when challenging times when we are all at home, understandably. And um, I thank God for our pastor, our general superintendent. Last Monday, he taught us how we can do this, to see, give our offerings and our tithes. And he told us then that uh, we could, if we have a means of transferring it to the uh, church account, do so. But if you cannot, that, you know, Monday, keep it aside. On Thursday, keep it aside. On Sunday, keep it aside. And uh, when the window is open, you take it to the bank and pay it. The account numbers of the church is clearly displayed on your screen as you listen to the message. Now, will you collect this thing Monday and Thursday, put it aside, and then suddenly something happens. Ah, that money I, I set aside for God. I think, uh, I, let me go and use that of it now. God, I'm borrowing your money. Do we have to do that? We should not do that. That's not right. And, uh, you know, or we keep the money there and we forget to take it to the bank. Do you know whether there's lockdown or no lockdown, there are services that the church we still have to give. Money we still have to be spent. That's why we are prompt about it. Or you have, you know, the, to give your offering and tithe at the time and you have the possibility of transferring the money to the bank, to the church account. Why don't you do it promptly? What manner, what motive do you have in giving to God? Are you doing it with all your heart? Or are you doing it as if you are under compulsion? We should not do it grudgingly. We should do it cheerfully. That's the kind of offering that our God accepts. We should do it sincerely. We should do it with love for God. We should do it sacrificially in serving the Lord. A lot needs to be done in the church. Building projects are ongoing. We still need to complete, you know, all our projects. And the outreaches sometimes are slowed down or are even abandoned because of lack of funds. Mission work is not at its best for the same reason. And if members have a proper understanding that all our wealth comes from God, all our knowledge comes from God, everything that we have belongs to God, that we are simple custodians, of this world, we must surrender them for the work of the Lord. It is sincere, insincere for anyone to give miserly and not bountifully. Because when we give, we shall reap a bountiful harvest. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 and verse 11. When we give bountifully, we caught God's love 
See, in Second Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 7. He says there in verse 7, Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, Every man according as he proposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudging of necessity, for God love it. You see, when you are giving bountifully, cheerfully to the Lord, oh, you become a beloved of God. Beloved of God. You see, this is my son. This is my daughter. And I'm telling you, when you have a father that loves you because of the way you relate with him, tell me that thing that you ask that father and he will not give it to you. Not only that, what about the ministers of God? When they see that uh, where there's no lack, we need to do a crusade, the money is there, we need to, you know, do a church planting, the money is there, we need to go out on mission, the money is there, we're having, you know, to uh, make sure that the, the building is well taken care of and we have the resources. You are making that man of God to be a man that will pray for you. Pray for me. Pray for all of us. Our ministers will be happy. They will be grateful to God that he, at his labor, their labors uh, are not in vain, that the sacrifice that they put in to serve the Lord is not wasted. And let's understand. It is not the quantum. It is not the value. It is not the volume of what we give that really matters. But the motive. You know the story of this uh, widow in Mark chapter 12. In the Bible study, our Father and the Lord taught us. If you look at it from verse 41 to verse 44 of Mark chapter 12. It, this was a widow. The, the, what she had was not even enough. To start thinking of a tenth of it. She gave everything to the Lord. And Jesus Christ noticed the giving. If you remember that teaching, that Monday Bible study, he, he, you know, he, he, the Lord, you know, pointed us to that teaching and said that she gave over and above every other person. Those that had money, wealth, they gave out of the abundance of what they had. But this woman gave of her penury, he gave of her poverty. Let's look at the account. In Mark chapter 12, I read from verse 29. Then Jesus answered him. The first of all, talking about the commandments now. And, uh, you know, if you love God, you will give. If you love God, you will sacrifice. If you love God, you will do everything in verse 41. Uh, and Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, the storehouse. Of God, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow had cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. That's sacrificial giving. That's giving that, you know, will cost us something. David said, I will not offer unto God. That will cost me nothing. If you look at the Macedonian church, they were poor in Acts in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians, turn your Bible, open your Bible with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And then you will see there, in from verse 1, moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty. See that? Trial, deep poverty, abounded unto the riches of their liberality. You see that? They were poor. They had trials. Well, we thank God that we are alive. In this period of Codif 19. I mean, you may be telling me, brother, you know, things are tough. Some of us may even have lost our jobs. Where do I get money to give? Do you have a widow's might? Give it. Prove God. You know, God will surprise you in a manner you cannot explain. It's so thrilling, so, you know, heartwarming. What's going on in our church, Deeper Life Bible Church? You know, during this period, the headquarters sent us help. Twice in Lagos here. Help. Food. So that we can take care of our members. That's, that's a model of love from our Father and the Lord. In the various districts and groups, people helped. They brought money and they bought food and they shared among the brethren. And it's not happening only here in Nigeria. It's happening outside the country. I was told of a particular country where the government gave money to, you know, those who are working 
but uh, the students uh, who are members of the church uh, in that country, they are not, uh, you know, in the, they are not citizens of the country, so they got nothing. You know what the church did? The members of the brethren, keep alive. They gather themselves together. They say, what about these students that have nothing? Uh, they can't get any subsidy from government. Even now, to transfer money to children abroad is a problem. And they gathered money together. And they shared among the students, among them. That's the kind of law we are talking about. Sincere law. Sharing and giving from the depths and the bottoms of our hearts. That's what God wants to see in our midst. And the Lord will see it in our midst in Jesus' name. I want to hear a good amen. Amen. Now, look at this fourth question. What are God's conditions for giving? And to what extent can a believer give? What are his conditions for giving? And to what extent? That's question number four. Now, let's go to the last point before we pray. The last point is certainty of reaping for the righteous sower. Now, note it. We already know that we reap. That the law of sowing and reaping is of a certainty. But the question is, what kind, who are the people the Lord is looking at in our study today? In particular, he's looking at righteous people. In Hosea chapter 10, Hosea chapter 10, Hosea is in the Old Testament, chapter 10. I'm going to read verse 12. So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and reign again. Righteousness upon us. If you look at Micah chapter 6, Micah chapter 6, I read from verse 8. Micah chapter 6, from verse 8. Here he says, he had, showed, he had showed thee, O man, what is good. And what does the law require of thee? But to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. If you look at 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. You know, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. You will see there that God is interested in righteousness. He's interested in a life that is completely given unto him. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, I am reading from verse 22. Here Samuel said, and Samuel said, had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now think, think of somebody that is giving tithe, giving offering every Sunday and he gives big, big, big money. And any time you say there's volunteer work, oh, I'm ready to work, I'm ready to work, and he's ready to do anything. But the person is not born again. He's not a child of God. All that giving is a waste of time. All that sacrifice is a waste of time. So what the Lord delights in is that we will give ourselves to him. We will become born again, become children of God. That's why the Macedonian church, they, first, they gave themselves first to the Lord. Before every other thing fell into place. It is that giving that God looks at and that God values most. Give your life to Christ. If you are not born again, understand. If you are not born again, then you are a sinner. If you are lying, adultery, fornication, stealing, cheating. Even if you steal the money from the office and bring it to the house of God and say, God, you know I stole this money, but, you know, just forgive me. I, I, that's why I brought this portion to you. I'm sorry. That's an abomination in the house of God. You don't do that. That's why we give our lives unto Christ first. When we are born again, hey, now, God is ready and is willing to receive our offerings and to bless us as a result of our giving. Now, let's take the last question. What is important the most important thing that you can give to God. And why should it be first before anything else? What's the most important thing that you can give to God? Why should it be number one before anything else? As we give liberally and cheerfully, God will never forget. He will give us good measure, shaking together, running over. Men will give unto us. Heaven will give unto us. God will give 
unto us. Now, I will give you answers to the questions. Now, you go to your notes. Question number one. Remember, I said, in what ways can one give to God? The answer is financial, material resources, our time, our talents, and everything that the Lord has blessed us with. Question number two was, why is it necessary to give bountifully to God? Why? In the natural, the answer, the more you sow, the more you reap. The more you give, the more you reap. So if you want to reap bountifully, what do you do? You give bountifully. Question three, explain the law of sowing and reaping. Of course, the more you sow, the more you reap. What you sow is what you reap. So, you sow bountifully and sow good seed. If you take rotten yam and you sow it in the ground, it will rot in the yam. It will not germinate. What you sow is what you reap. If you go to your mirror and smile to that mirror, what you receive back is a smile. If you frown to the mirror, what you get is a frown. So, so good to receive good. Question number four was, what are God's conditions for giving? And to what extent can a believer give? The simple, sincere heart. You have to give cheerfully. We have to give sacrificially. We have to give bountifully as God has prospered us. And finally, question number five. What is the most important thing you can give to God? Why should it be given first before anything else? You give your life to God. You give your life to Christ. Now, you can score yourself. You got everything right. That's 100%. But then, it's 100% on paper. The Lord wants us to go out and score 100% in action. And thank God that today is Sunday. A day to worship the Lord. When we have heard the word of God like this, what do we do? We go out and we practice it. We do it first. The time of tithe and offering. Don't miss it. Give your tithe. Give your offering. If you are the one that has been borrowing God's money from month to month, you don't give. You don't pay your tithe. Don't give your offering. And you say, God, understand this month. Next month I will pay. I will pay everything together. You are stealing from God. You are robbing God. And what the Lord said in Malachi chapter 3, let's read that one, so that we are warned ahead of time. So that we do not say we, are, we do not know. We do not say that I'm not aware. Uh, oh, don't tell me that it's pandemic. You know, pandemic will come and go. Because our Father and the Lord has prayed for us. And I am telling you, at the end of this pandemic, none of us will be missing in Jesus' name. I want to hear an amen. Amen. He says there that in verse 9 of Malachi chapter 3. He said, you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Who want to be under the curse of God? It's a terrible thing. Don't try it. So give. There's blessing waiting for you. God says, give. God says, so. And abundance is going to be a portion in Jesus' name. As we close, look at Luke chapter 6. Verse 38. The word of God is clear and we need to just appropriate that to ourselves today. And then we obey it. And I'm telling you that this year, beyond our expectation, the Lord is going to bless us mightily as we obey his word in Jesus' name. He says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down. Shaking together. Running over. Shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. I am expecting abundance this year. And I know you are expecting abundance this year. I am expecting that beyond the COVID-19, that when everything looks dry and dreary and terrible, God will make us, who are his own sons and daughters, that live in Goshen. We are not with the Egyptians. We live in a different land altogether. We are in the land of Goshen, a land of protection. We live in a house that is marked by the blood of the Lamb. And therefore, no evil shall befall us. If we indeed are the children of God, and we know that this is our right, let's do what God has called us to do. Let's rise up and go to the Lord in prayer now. We are going to, you have scored 100%, 80% on paper. You tell the Lord, I am going out today. I will not miss today's offering time, today's tight time. And when I leave here, I will 
I give the best. I, can, I will go to my neighbor and talk to the tell me about Christ. I will send text messages. I will send WhatsApp messages. I will tell them about the Savior. I will, you know, preach the gospel. Whatever means I have, I will speak to that brother, that sister in, at home. I will encourage him. I will encourage her. I will pray with him. I will give to him. I will give to her. I will look out for my brothers and sisters that in this difficult time are going through tough, tough time. Some cannot, have not been able to eat. Some, you know, uh, they, are, they lack one thing or the other. And then, as I get calls from them, as I check up on them, whatever you lay in my hand, O oh Lord, I will not eat it alone. I will give and I will share. Give your life to Christ. Are you born again? Give to the service of the Lord. What are you doing in the kingdom? Give your resources, your finance, your talent to God. Are you doing it bountifully or, and cheerfully? Or are you doing it grudgingly? Give cheerfully to our fellow brothers, your fellow sisters. In this challenging time, or do you eat everything all alone? You say, I have only one tube of yarn. Cut it into two, brother, sister. Cut it into two. Somebody else needs the other half. Don't mind where the other half will come from. When the time comes, prove God. I am telling you, you will have in abundance. Remember, so nothing, reap nothing. So bountifully, reap bountifully. So good, reap good. So evil, reap evil. That's the law. God will make us to make the right choice. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you because of your word. You are a mighty God. You want to bless your people. You want to bless your children. Father, we are praying that our eyes have been opened today to see the need to sow. Give for the work of the Lord. Give our tithes and offering. Give everything that you have blessed us with, our energy, our time, our resources, our talents, for the work of the kingdom. Remember our brothers and sisters that are hurting right now. Oh Lord, we pray as we obey your word. Lord, your blessings will be multiplied upon our lives in Jesus' name. Lord, we are expecting good measure. Press down, shaking together, running over. We are going to receive even this week and the rest of our lives in Jesus' name. Lord, where we have, uh, you know, anyone has cheated you, has told lies, have robbed you, Father, we pray for mercy and forgiveness. And we're asking that from today. None will rob you in Jesus' name. We know you have answered our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen.